We are now recording. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we are have a presentation with uh, Elaine, uh, Dr. Elaine Marshall from uh, Long Island, uh, New York. She's presenting on SOFLA, Synchronous Online Flipped Learning Approach. Uh, please welcome. And presenter, please go ahead. OK, so um, I just want to let everybody know that um, this is uh, this is a flipped session. So I was hoping that people might do their pre-work ahead of time, but it doesn't matter if you did it or didn't, but let's start with put a green check if you did. Put a green check if you don't know where it is, it's in the participant pod, it's the far left and it says yes. So let's see if you did the pre-work, okay? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're in the right place because I'll be talking about it. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. And Jose, did you see the links I sent you? I hope you saw them. Okay. All right. So, uh, so the first thing to know about uh, pre-work, and you can see if you look at the, the checks there, this is interesting because there are five checks but actually I'm getting that eight people did the pre-work. So perhaps people did the pre-work and they're not here yet or they're not coming. Okay, so, um, so one thing about uh, this model that I'm showing you is that it's based on the flipped learning approach. And part of the flipped learning approach is that you do something before class, before the students come to class, pre-work. And so I wanted to model it a little bit because this is kind of a workshop. So I wanted to give you a chance to do pre-work, but we're going to take a look at the pre-work, even though, um, you know, let's say a third of you did it. All right. But this is a conference. I'm not giving you a grade. You're not my students. So it would be a higher percentage if, it, if you were actually in a class with me. I taught my class last night and uh, out of 18 students, 15 uh, had done all the pre-work and I gave them a good bit to do. So just to give you the idea, I walk the walk. I'm not just talking the talk. Okay. All right. So I'm actually uh, in New York, uh, just outside of New York City. I'm not on Long Island. It's one of those things. It's the Long Island University, uh, but it's it's got a lot of tentacles out all over the place. And um, I'm in Westchester County. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that, but that's where I am. Um, and I have another hat, which is my uh, Mal LLC, because I do technology, which is why I'm here today with you. But my other hat is culturally responsive teaching. And I do a lot with that in terms of my books, my research, my publications, all my serious, well, this is serious, but I mean, my actual discipline within uh, language education is uh, culturally responsive teaching. But a strange thing happened to me. I got into technology and I'd like to share my excitement with you. Okay, so this is uh, basically a definition of SOFLA. Very quickly, it's a distance learning model. I like to keep this slide in in case someone ever just wants to look at the PowerPoint. There it is, okay. That closely replicates uh, actual classroom teaching, includes structured interactive multimodal activities that you'll see both asynchronous and synchronous participants learn how to implement the eight step, eight step learning cycle and you'll have resources. I have a ton of links that are gonna be appearing in the chat, but I also want you to know that one of the slides also has all the links on it. And there's a PDF of, link, of the slides that I've uploaded and there's a link to the slides. So I'm covered different ways. So you can just relax and you'll get everything, okay? All right, so I have a mantra <laughs> and whenever I present, regardless of whether it's um, my mouth model or my SOFLA model, I like to talk about creating fertile spaces. And uh, usually I tell people, you know, say the mantra, we're starting create fertile spaces. What the hell does that mean? Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is we focus on covering curriculum we focus on delivering instruction, we focus on meeting standards, but what we really need to do, especially as language teachers, is create fertile spaces for our students so that they will want to generate language and they will feel that they have ownership. So I do that with, with four E's. The first E, 
And I do this, uh, the four E's through the presentation. So you'll see it cycling around, okay? The first is equity. A lot of people think equity is all you need. Once you have equity, you're done. It's just the beginning. You then need enrichment because there's a lot of competition out there and you want your class to be compelling. So you have to have enrichment. You need engagement because it can be, they can be motivated and you can put wonderful things out there, but if they're not engaging with it, it still will flop. And then finally, um, empowerment, which is not a transitive verb. You don't empower people. People empower themselves as a result of your creating these spaces. Okay, so you get the, the general overall view of the four E's and creating fertile spaces. Okay. All right. Um, so I saw in the pre-work <laughs> that one of you is, is, is a little bit, and I'm not overstating this because you should see the responses, a little bit negative <laughs> about uh, moving to online learning. And I, I hear ya, okay? So, um, so I like to start with this quote from Darwin. It's not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And so, you know, there's change and uh, some people are kicking and screaming, some students are, some faculty are, some administration, but here are some things to keep in mind. This might help. First of all, we have uh, equivalencies. So you don't have to start from scratch. You're teachers or, you know, you supervise teachers and you already have something that you can use. You can bring a lot of things right over to online. On the other hand, there will be limitations. There are going to be things that you can't do the same way that you used to do. And you have to accept that. That's part of the reality of it, all right? In addition, there are advantages. So there are things that you can do even better online than you could in person. And you will find what those are for you, for your context. So these three came from David Rosen, uh, on a listserv, it's not a publication, but it was a conversation we were having uh, in, in an adult literacy group about instructional technology. And he came up with these three and I said, I would like to add a fourth and we discussed that. And so there's now the fourth, which is innovations. There can be things that you do with your students that you never even could do before, but now you can because you're online. Okay. So keep these in mind as I go through SOFLA and think to yourself, you know, where you are with these four. All right. Now, the next thing I wanna do is, is kind of um, remind you of the roots of SOFLA, that it really does come from the flipped learning tradition. So now I'd like it, a green check. Let me just clear your checks. Green check, if you've heard of flipped learning, just heard of it, that's all, just heard of it. Who's heard of it? And I'm not putting anybody on the spot here, but I just want to know what we've got in terms of people who have heard of flip learning. Get some idea of where you are with it. Okay, so a good number of you have not heard of flip learning. So what we're going to do now is in the chat, those of you who have heard of flip learning, and don't we're not Googling and copying now, just off the top of your head, top of your head. Uh, what do you know about it? When you think of flipped learning, those of you who have heard of it, please put in the chat, share whatever you can think of about it. Doesn't have to be long. Just put a little something down, okay? Put a little something down that you've heard of flipped learning. Now, those of you who haven't heard of it, please read the chat so you get some kind of an idea. Take a look at what's going on in the chat. And then also I'll give you a very brief intro to it. Uh, and this is a website. If the facilitators could pop in my links, that would save me a lot of trouble, but I don't know if you're set up to do that. I sent you the links. So that's the Flip Learning Network. Um, basically what happens is, instead of doing your direct teaching of whatever your lesson is for that particular day, you farm that outside of your class. And then what you would have sent them home to do on their own, you actually do that interactively in class, okay? But that's a very broad brush. And if you do that exact, what I just said, that's not really the whole thing about flipped learning. But you can go to the website and you can look up uh, in more detail and there's tons of out there on it, okay? So what did I do? 
what, what I did was um, I took flip learning, which uh, I started to do in 2011. And I took online learning, which I started to do back in 2008. I, I worked on uh, online courses for many years and then started offering an entire program online, but I still had in-person courses when I heard about flipping. I didn't connect the two until 2016. And then I said, wait a minute, I can flip online. So that's when I started to come up with this idea of SOFLA, which is a kind of a recipe that's a combination of flipping and online learning. So that's how that got started. And the first thing that I published on it was just a blog post about my class. And I'm putting that in the chat. If you want to see how it first started, this is an old version of it. Uh, so what I'm showing you tonight is, is more of, of an updated version. But if you want to see the history of it, that's the first article. All right. So now, um, all right. So this is, um, this is a list of four key questions. And uh, many of you haven't heard of flipped learning. So this is a good place to start for you. So the first question is uh, what to put out of class, what to take out of class and what to keep in class. How do you decide that? Okay. And the second question is for the out of class work, how do you maximize comprehension and retention? Because if you give them something to do out of class and you're not with them and they don't understand it, they don't retain it. When they come to class, you've wasted your time. You have to reteach. So that's really important. And then in class, right? We're language teachers, you want interaction, right? So you have to maximize the interaction when they're with you. And also that's your chance to differentiate in class. So that's the question for in class. And then for both out of class and in class, you wanna make sure you build in accountability. I found this out the hard way. <laughs> uh, you have to build in accountability and feedback for all aspects, both out of class and in class to ensure that you have a solid instructional model. And when I say feedback, I don't only mean from the teacher to the students, I mean from the students back to the teacher and among the students, which I'll show you as we go. And this article is an article that goes into uh, more detail about that. And I'm looking for it right now. Here it is. Okay. Um, the four questions are discussed in more detail in this article. It doesn't look so by the title. The title is kind of a general getting started with video lessons. But in that article, we talk about the four questions. So that's why I'm posting it now. Okay. All right. Now we're going to do um, the eight steps of SOFLA, which is the main part of what we're doing today. So it has eight steps and I'm gonna show them to you just quickly here. You can see. And although it's steps, it's also a cycle. And so I prefer to look at it this way. And you can see that the pre-work is a different color because that's really the linchpin of the whole model. If you don't get the pre-work right, then everything falls apart. And that's why we're going to spend more time on that step uh, than the other steps. Now, if you're interested in an article, a more recent article that just came out in August, uh, this article that I'm posting here, and remember, all the links are on the, sli on the slide, the link slide. But this article just came out in, in August and it's probably the most up to date. So I showed you the first one, here's the last one, okay? Uh, it actually goes, it has this graphic, uh, Marshall and Koska, and uh, it goes through all of the eight steps, much more detail than I'm doing right now. This is really an awareness level <laughs> of SOFLA. Okay, all right, so let's go. Um, now we start with the pre-work. So. The pre-work is usually a video lesson or shared readings. It depends on how you teach and what you teach. Sometimes you can use both or one or alternate them, but whatever you do, that's your explicit instruction and it's asynchronous, but it has to be structured, interactive, multimodal, all of those in order to get them to really do it, okay? 
you're targeting your instruction directly to your students. It doesn't mean you can't reuse it in other years, but you still have to tweak it and make sure that it fits the class you have at the moment. And then you're embedding questions and activities so that they are not only, I wouldn't say only, the receptive skills are important, right? But uh, they're not watching and reading, they're interacting with the material. And if they're not interacting, that's not really pre-work because the work part isn't there, okay? And then what's beautiful about it is you download the data and you can analyze it. Uh, for example, you, those of you who did the pre-work, I see what you did here. So I asked you, I asked you quite a few questions and your opinions about things. And I found out a lot about the people who did the pre-work, which helped me get an idea ahead of time uh, of where you're coming from and who you are and that sort of thing, okay? And if we had a longer workshop, you know, we would do a lot more with that pre-work together. We might have a chance, but I, I need to move on. So that is the essence of the guidelines for the pre-work. So how do I do that? Now, I just want to caution you. I'm a pedagogy person, not a tool person. I'm a faculty. I'm not IT. So I'm not that much into the exactly all the tools and everything. I find a tool I like, I learn how to use it and I use it, okay? So that's not my area so much. Um, I'm into uh, more instructional design. Uh, so anyway, here's um, here are some suggestions for the kinds of things that you can flip if you're a language teacher, all right? Uh, you can obviously flip authentic examples, all right, of language. But again, you're not going to have them just watch the talk. If you do that, you're going to you're going to design it as a lesson. These are lessons, concepts and, and structures of language, concepts about language. Again, lessons. These are lessons. Just that they bounce off the material. So that's what we're talking about. Low level Bloom. So Bloom's taxonomy is kind of a piece of this, which is the idea. One of the ideas of flipping is that the higher levels of Bloom that are more difficult can be done when we're all together and the lower levels can be taken care of outside of class. So practice exercises. And when I say learning strategies, um, I don't really mean there, or I should say Robin Brinks Lockwood, what she's referring to there is teaching them about a strategy like context clues or something, but it's a video lesson about it. And then when they come to class, they're gonna practice the strategy. All right, so you see, that's what the difference is. All right, you're presenting it. Uh, listening passages, sure, you don't have to, work on that in class, you can have them do it interactively. And uh, and then the third one is pre-work, I mean, is peer work. And they can work on projects. They can, they can work on peer instruction, which I'll show you later. Um, I do that in my grammar class. I'll show you. <laughs> and uh, also any kind of online interaction that you already probably do, you know, discussions or building wikis together or whatever they do, all right? And then the last one, which teachers don't like to hear, is stop talking about procedures. Give them, uh, what I do is I give them a, a video of me going down a document as I talk about it. I also post the document. I also send it out as an announcement. You know, So there are all kinds of ways that you can give them course procedures and assignment instructions. And it's better anyway, because they're all, always asking, what did what do we do? When is it due? How long? What do you want? This eliminates a lot of questions, okay? And I call, um, you remember the four E's. So the pre-work is really about equity because everybody comes in kind of at a different place, but when you're doing the pre-work, whatever you pick from you know, this uh, kind of buffet, whatever you decide to do, those of them who need to spend more time on it, go through it several times. Others can do it quickly. Uh, you can even differentiate the pre-work sometimes and put in a little something extra for certain students. That's where equity comes in. So by the time they come to class, they have done what each student did need to do in order to get where you needed them to be when they come to class. So that's why I talk about this as part of equity, the pre-work. And okay, this is what I use. I use PlayPosit. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. Uh, it's very similar to Edpuzzle, which more people have heard of, but it's essentially, uh, it's essentially an application where you import your videos 
and then you build the lesson with the videos. It has some minor editing that you can do if you want. It's not like Camtasia or anything like that, but you can edit your videos when you get them in. You can bring them in from your computer. You can break, do homemade. You can bring in, if you have the right to do so, you can bring in all kinds of other videos, whatever you like. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so uh, you have your, I, I do a, I, I do teacher ed, so I try to talk, I talk about uh, methodology and such. So, uh, so um, ed puzzle, 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 like you put a puzzle together. Okay, I'm against hand raising, I'll tell you right away. I think it rewards the same people who already know the answer. I don't want to get into that today. But anyway, that's one of my slides. So I ask them a question, and this is a poll, so they can answer this according to what happens in their class. And you, they have to, it stops, they, can, they have no choice. The, it, the, the video stops, the question pops out, they answer it, they hit submit, and then they hit continue, and then they can continue. And what you can do with your students is you can, well, you can have any kind of question that you can imagine. They can even record audio when they record their answers. You can record audio for your questions. There's so much you can do with PlayPause. There's a free version. The free version is pretty good, but you don't get all the wonderful data to download. That's the one drawback, but it's not that expensive. Anyway, what I was trying to say, I wanted to mention, you preload feedback. So if you have, say, a multiple choice or some question that where someone goes off base on their answer, you can pre you predict if they pick that, ah, this is their problem. And you can put the feedback in in advance. They really get it. They enjoy it. OK, so this is what I use. I use PlayPosit. All right. Uh, the other tool I use is my new favorite tool, uh, is Perusal. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that, but again, I'm not about the tools, but this particular one is the way you do um, embedded interactions for reading. So what happens in Perusal is all your students go together asynchronously to the same document, the literally the same document. Uh, if it's a textbook, you work with your publisher to um, to negotiate with perusal and the students buy the ebook they each have to buy it but you're all reading the same copy or you can upload anything you have the right to again you know we have to think about that you upload it into that uh, space or you can download a website but it isn't uh, it isn't a, a dynamic it's a static website um, but I'm going to show you what it looks like so this is perusal now in perusal, you have three columns. On the left is your navigation. You can see this is my SOFLA course that I'm gonna invite you to. It's a free course on SOFLA, just jump in with everybody. We're having a good time in there. I'll give you the link to that later if you stay. Ah, okay, uh, all right. So you can see you highlight and then on the, that's the text in the middle. And then on the right, See, I said this article addresses online flipping, focuses, blah, 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 and then, uh, the students all have, they, they can have an avatar like I do or just their initials, whatever. I mean, I don't need to go into the detail of it, but they can quest, put questions, you can put questions, they can upvote, they can talk to each other. It's like social media. So students are very motivated with it. It gets them to read and it gets you to know because I'm not showing you all of the tools that it has, but one thing it has is you can find out exactly how long they were reading, how many comments and interactions they had, on the space so you can find out a, a lot about uh what they're doing when they're in perusal okay so uh so it's a very good tool for pre-work so that's what i use for pre-work okay now they come to now that's it i said i would spend longer time on pre-work because as i said that's the that's the key to the whole the whole model all right so now we're in class now this is still part of equity so what happens in, in class when they first come in, you don't start class, you just have a board and on the board, whatever kind of board you have, you can use a Google Doc, you can use the whiteboard in Zoom, you can do whatever you want, but you have to have a board. I even have, I actually have, oh, I didn't, I shouldn't have done that. I was trying to turn my computer and that was probably not a good idea. I was gonna show you, I have a board over here, but that's okay, you don't have to look at it. I have markers, I have old school too, all right. Anyway, but that's not, you wouldn't use that for the sign-in because you're the only one that can get to that board. But I do use that for some pieces of lessons. So these uh, sign-in activities, 
they know when they come to class. In fact, I have a, a go-getter who goes in early to check the pre-work so she knows in advance what it's going to, I mean the sign-in, so she knows what it's going to be. She goes in ahead of time. So you can do cognitive or affective. The cognitive ones are usually going to go back to the pre-work, but you don't have to do that every time. But they should know that they're accountable and that the sign-in might be based on the pre-work. So here I do second language acquisition, so I have them watch a Pinker video and do some work with it. And then I ask, what surprised you? Well, if they didn't watch the video, how can they put what the surprise them? You know, you have to be very crafty, but we're all crafty, right? Okay, and then the next question was about another time I did um, the relationship between a deficit and social justice. Um, chapter seven of their textbook, can teachers help? And again, how do they know what teachers can help with if they didn't do the reading? So that would be a sign in. And then what's beautiful about the sign in is they all see what everyone else put. I always ask them, notice the board. What do you notice? Are there patterns? And then we have a little discussion. The other thing is, the elephant is in the room, so every now and then you have to acknowledge it. So I have asked them on occasion, I asked them, how's it going with you? How have you been affected? And we had quite a talk about COVID. And the other one was fall when it came, fall came here in New York. I just thought it would be a fun thing. And then I, what I followed it up with is, okay, what could you do with students? If you asked your, your language students, what's their favorite thing about fall? What kind of ac language activities could you build from that? Because I'm teaching methods course. So you get the idea, you you do what you want, but it's, it's kind of equity because if people didn't do the pre-work, that's a good way to kind of get them caught up a little bit with what might've happened in the pre-work because they see what other people are putting. Okay, so that's another piece. All right, now whole group, whole group is the next one. So this is what I call the dangerous step. Um, this is also where we get into enrichment. Uh, you want to make this activity very compelling. It's got to be something they really want to do because you need everyone to participate, not just your high participators. And it's dangerous because what some teachers do is they reteach. Don't reteach. Even if some of them didn't do the pre-work, you're not going to be punitive, but you're not going to give up. And eventually they'll start catching on. They have to do the pre-work. They'll have what we call, I don't know if you have that expression, but we say FOMO, fear of missing out. So they'll sort of catch on, oh, the pre-work was cool and I missed it, or and there's peer pressure and things like that. So you want to use this whole group time either to clarify something, if I, like I look at the play posit and everybody missed number three. Um, that's what I'm going to do for the whole group. I'm going to des design an activity that builds on that question. Or if the pre-work went pretty well and they seemed kind of solid, I'm going to do something that takes it farther, like a higher level bloom activity. Okay, so this is where your, your creativity comes in as a teacher and give them something enriching to do, something that's going to be exciting and compelling. All right, and then um, this next step, after enrichment, you gave them something, now they're all you know, motivated. That's when you send them to the individual rooms and this is where they engage. So this is the third E, engagement. And this is their favorite step because they get away from you. And when they get into the breakouts, they love to talk. And there are some teachers that misunderstand and they tell me, oh, I don't wanna do breakouts because, because they just waste their time and then they're shy and they don't talk and nothing happens when I go in the breakout, they're just sitting there, uh-uh-uh, that's on you. Because if you design the breakout well, very structured with accountability and the right amount of time, it's okay if they spend a little time chit-chatting, that's not a problem, I don't mind that. But they have something to do and they know when I pull them out, which you'll see step five in a minute, they know that they need to, to make that time count. Also, you can send them little messages along the way and you can go into the different rooms and check out and see how they're doing, okay? Now, this slide has a lot of other stuff on it that I'm not gonna mention because this is an equivalency. So remember, there are some things that you don't have to throw out. If you do group work, that's what this is. It's just the electronic version of group work, all right? So next is share out. Now, share out is an important key because if they know, they might be called on. Now, last night, I had five groups, and I went into every group, and I don't want to embarrass people, and group two did not do a very good job, so I'm not going to call on group two to share, but
but I called on group, room five did great job. So I said, oh, let's see, um, how about group five? You know, so <laughs> group five, and they all put their webcams on, they showed the whiteboard of what they had done. And then the other groups can see, you know, what another, what the group that really uh, made it happen did. Now, if you see on the right, I use the shack technique. Um, Khaled Fethi uh, came up with this. It's, it seems so simple. And when I tell people about it, I said, so what? They say, they say, what's the big deal? But I tell you why it's so good. Because if you just tell students to give each other feedback, sometimes they don't feel comfortable doing that or they don't know exactly how to go about it. Um, but this is in the middle. It's not totally free, like just give feedback, but it's not so controlling that you say, give feedback on X, Y, Z, all right? This means that they feel like, oh, I can share something that I know that relates to what they did, or I can ask for, I can give them some help, or I can ask them a question. It just, it's just a little gimmick almost, but it works. The students really like it. I use it for perusal. When they're reading in perusal, I always say read and shack. OK, and then I use it for blogs, for wikis, everything, discussion forums, shack, shack, shack. OK, all right, so that's share out. Next step is preview and discovery. Preview and discovery is uh, probably the most important step. Wait, didn't I have option two here? Ah, I didn't have option two. OK, that's OK. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, there's another option for breakouts. So. Um, this is probably the most important step other than pre-work. You know why? Because this gets them to do the pre-work. If you do a good job of step six, you're upping the percentage and the likelihood of the pre-work. Why? Because step six is when you give them a little hint of what they're gonna be doing for the next class. You can show them a piece of the video. You can show them a piece of the reading. You can also front load vocabulary so they feel, and this is, kind of the beginning of the fourth E, empowerment. So what you're really doing here is empowering. They're, they're, they're feeling that, yeah, I can do the next task because you're giving them some new concepts, some new vocabulary. You're also getting them curious about it. You might uh, ask them to think about something that they don't know much about, but you say, oh, well, you're gonna find out about it. It's a little bit related to um, the Friarian idea of problem posing, kind of an inquiry based approach where you get them to think ahead. So when they get to the pre-work, oh yeah, that's what she meant, or that's what we talked about, or that's that word I didn't know, or that's that new concept. So it can be a very powerful step. It also gives you some informal assessment ahead of time before they are going to the new pre-work. And sometimes I've had to tweak it even because I can see, uh-oh, we're going to have a problem here, or gee, this is going to be too easy, too hard, or whatever. I missed miss judge it a little bit, you can make adjustments based on that. So I call it the preview and discovery step. And it is instructor led. And it is a tiny bit like teaching, but it's such a tiny piece that, you know, you're just giving them the hint, a hint ahead of time. Okay. All right. Next is um, what I call the boring step. I have nicknames for these steps. Okay. So, so this one is just to give the assignment. So what you're doing here is you're giving them the pre-work, the exact instructions. This is what you're going to do. You're going to go to PlayPosit. You're going to see this video. You're going to blah, blah, blah. And you can do uh, whatever you want them to do. And again, we said that the, the pre-work will be different depending on how you teach and what you teach. It might be working on their blog that week, or it could be posting to a wiki, or anything that you ask them to do is the assignment. The only thing I say about step seven is um, I do it three ways. The reason I do that is that everybody thinks differently. So some, some students want to be told, others want to read it. Um, some of them are interested that moment, others are not even listening to you. And then the next day, they're going to wonder what it was. So what I do is I do it uh, right then and there during class. I tell them and I show them a document. Then I have it up on the platform, usually in two places, because, you know, people navigate their platforms differently. Some students look here, some look there. So I always put it, because it's an assignment, I always put it in two places. So no one says, oh, where is it? Well, it's here or there. You look where you, where you prefer. And the third is I send out announcements. So I always send out every single assignment. They know it's going to go rocketing into their mailbox. They're going to see the assignment with any links, and there are plenty of them. All the links are in there. 
in the announcement. And I even send a reminder right shortly before class. I send, rem remember, blah, 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 and I, I re-up it. You know, you, it's never too much for online. It's never too much. And people say, why are you doing all that? Well, if there's something about being online that makes them feel that it's not quite as compelling as in person. It's, it's just, a, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't ask me why. Okay, but anyway, I have strategies. And then the last one is the reflection. Just remember the sign in? Well, the reflection is similar. They have to put their name. That's the only two times they must put their name, the sign in and the reflection. So the reflection is their chance to tell me what resonated with them. So I don't ask a specific question. It's what did you get? What sticks? What resonates? And if they just say to me, great class, learned a lot, or now I know blah, blah, something, I, I erase it. I get rid of it, it's gone. So they learn very quickly that they have to put something substantive. I wanna know what did they learn? I know they could have learned 10 things. I want them to pick one. They say, oh, I learned so much, pick one. And what's nice about that is you get a board again, just like the sign-in, you, you're filling the board and they can all see what everyone else put. So they're seeing how it resonated with each other. And, I, and one thing, last thing to say about this is that everything is transparently made available. So I put up, I, I do, um, you know, I download or screenshot or depending what it is, the sign-in, the whole group application, everything from every breakout becomes transparent. The uh, reflection becomes transparent and there's a recording of the lesson and everything goes up. So anyone who was absent, came late, left early or was falling asleep or whatever they were, I don't know, but they have access to everything. And I just think that's so important. And that's a kind of an advantage, isn't it? Isn't that an advantage of being online and teaching synchronously? They have everything. We don't have snow days either. <laughs> oh, well. Just a funny little, okay. So this is your step eight. Um, so I'm giving you, I kind of stopped giving you some links, but here are the links uh, to, um, I wanted to give you the link to play posit and perusal. Just a second, um, you know, sometimes Zoom just gets in the way. It, I don't like where it puts itself. Okay, there we go. All right, so that's the link to PlayPosit Perusal. Um, the article I did with, uh, let's see, where is your, and here's your reflection. I'm just gonna make sure you get all the links and then we'll do questions. Okay, that's your reflection. It's only three questions, but I like to know what you got out of today's session. And then Perusal is where I'll be. You can come and join, just go to Perusal and there's the code. It's not secret, you can share it with anyone. It's my name, Marshall hyphen, that's just a hyphen, and H-M-W-N-U. And you'll find all kinds of people from all over the world because whether I do this in, I do it in Morocco, I did it in Canada, all of it, I do everywhere. Everyone's together in the same course. So you'll see, we'll all be together if you wanna follow up, okay? And you can always email me too. Um, and this is the link to the slideshow. All right, uh, and I have I have a lot more to share, but I I'm going to hold it there. There are more some more slides, but we'll hold it right there. There's the model, okay? Uh, because I know people want to ask questions. I had a sample lesson to show you and some data from my classes. Those are the other two things I have. But the data is on the slides. After this, there's more slides with data. And then I can give you the link to uh, a sample, uh, a sample SoFlow lesson. Okay. So, uh, Jean Pierre, if you want to tell me about the questions, there's also questions uh, in the pre-work. So, uh, we've uh, there are no questions except for the one about the uh, Edu puzzle. Uh, That's so, it. Yeah, you were just too amazing. So people were just uh, what? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Questions? No? No. Um, okay, here they come now. Uh, this is an accurate statement. Too amazing. <laughs> Too amazing. So um, how would you like to... 
Oh yeah. The question now is, could you tell us about the second option for breakouts? Oh, yes. Okay. The second option is peer instruction. And um, you'll read about that in the article that says um, Marshall and Rodriguez Buitrago. That one was put in the chat. And what we do there is every student, I use this in my grammar class, every student has to do a flipped grammar lesson. They have to prepare a video. I have them use Screencast-O-Matic. And they, 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 a lot of them have never done it before. They're really nervous, but I have tons of directions. Again, video directions, screenshot directions, PDF document directions. They, they learn to do play posit. They have to make just a seven to eight minute video of their grammar point that they become an expert on. I meet with them ahead of time and make sure that they understand it before they teach it. And what they do is they come to class. So we do this, if it's a big class, they do it in breakouts, so they don't have to do it for the whole class. So I might have two separate rooms, and then I, they, they flip rooms, okay, and they get the lessons. Or if it's a small class, they can do it for everybody. So what they do is they play, they push play, they show the video in class, and they stop it, and they ask a question, and the students have to put the answer in the chat, or they can do audio answers, but it's live, so you have the recorded students, so they're not so nervous because they make they recorded it ahead of time and they have their list of questions they ask the students and at the end of their little lesson that they did they have a quiz and the quiz is usually google form and everyone has to go and i get to find then i get to find out uh did the students understand the grammar point from the peer instruction and i can clear things up if not but uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, they first of all, they love the idea that they're doing a flip themselves because I teach that way. And then they, a lot of them say they really like doing learning from each other sometimes. You know, sometimes they say their their peers do almost a better job <laughs> than we do because they, they understand what's hard about it more than we do, <laughs> okay? So at any rate, that's what the other option is uh, than a traditional breakout. Oh, that's my answer to that. Yeah. I'm no. gonna the next question to you. Uh, the next question yeah. is, many of us teach online only to students who could not come to the face-to-face -face version of the lesson. So in essence, we're teaching the same lesson twice, once online, once face-to-face. -face. Any advice about how to make that balance or make ease our, ease our load, perhaps? Well, first question uh, is, I'm not sure if you're asking me this, but are they at a distance and in person at the same moment in time? Or are you doing it at separate times? Because that's very different. Can I okay. ask Stephen to un unmute himself and ask the question himself? Oh, hi, Steve. Hello. Hey, I know you. Hi, we Good met Good to yesterday. see you again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> most students can come to class, but some of them don't come to class. So once, that, okay. once I know who's not there, I teach them separately online. Hmm. And that's mandated. There's no way to avoid that. Right. OK, well, if you if you record your in person, you could record your in person class and ask them to watch it. That's one option. And then you could provide a guide, a written guide with questions that they should be able to answer if they watch the in person class. And then when you meet with them, then you can address the issues they faced and also do higher levels of bloom kind of interactive activities. That would be the way I would handle it. If that helps. Okay. Uh, you Great. Yuichi Ishikawa, can I ask you to turn on your mic and ask your question? Yuichi, please go ahead. Uh, we can't hear you, Yuichi. I can't hear you. I just want to show the next slide is the links so everyone sees it while we're waiting for the question. That's uh, the link slide. Maybe there's an audio problem. I'll, I'll and these are, these are the principles behind the four E's on this slide. Okay, write the question in the chat. Let's see. Uh, the question is- What is the level of my students in CEFR or TOEFL? Oh, no, actually um, I do teacher education. So my, I taught, I taught for many, many years. I taught students at all levels. Oh. ESL and uh, EFL, but right now I teach teachers. She will be the actual room host for the VIP one because apparently Jimmy is not uh, available today at all. Why?
Sorry about that. I apologize. Okay, I, I don't teach direct service now. I teach teachers. My students are teacher education, but you can adapt this. I mean, I'm working on versions of SOFLA for elementary school, for, um, for adult literacy. SOFLA is, SOFLA is a, a template and you take the template and you make it work for your students. I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I don't need to, necessarily be teaching exactly what you're teaching in order for you to use it is what I'm saying. It's, it, it's conceptual in nature. I'm giving you a template, all right? And this is just some quick data since we, if we don't have any other questions. Um, this is um, how my students, I put some quotes on the right. Um, I've taken online courses, but not with as much interaction. I'm currently taking another online course. It doesn't have a specific meeting time. I'm not enjoying it as much. And you can see with the bars going across pre-course and post-course that they really did move up as far as taking online. I'm sorry, um, using... do you mind if I read the question? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, who were the participants in your class? I ask this question because I'm curious how culture, cultural differences affect on flip learning. For example, do you think that people from a certain culture are more willing to move on to flip learning or vice versa? Okay, that's a great, great question. So is it for every teacher? Is it for every student? Right, we ask that. Maybe it's not for every teacher either. And maybe it's not for every student. So it's true that this is a complete paradigm shift. And it's just as hard for teachers as it is for students. But I do think that no matter who, who you are, no matter what kind of teacher you are, kind of student you are, if you're gentle with yourself, the power of it will come through because you, you'll be more effective as a teacher and the students will do better in their classes as students. But you don't just impose it. It's like anything else. You need to start very gradually and you need to talk about the fact that you are teaching because a lot of students feel like I'm in class, teach me. But that's one of the whole points is it's going to be their class. It's gonna be tailored more to them and less to you. And they might, make, they might get angry about that in the beginning because you're the authority and they want you to be the authority. But you know, that's not how second language acquisition or foreign language acquisition works. You know that they have to become input generators. I mean, there are all kinds of things they need to do if they're really gonna master the language. So this is, this is a way to kind of get at what's really best for them, but you do have to do it gradually and not impose it completely. So you might flip a lesson now and then, and then do a little questionnaire. How did you feel? Did you miss me being in the front of the room teaching? You know, deal with the feelings, always deal with the affective too, okay? Um, and be slow and, but don't give up, don't give up because it does take time. This didn't happen to me overnight either. So just to say, but my students are mostly, I have a mix. I have some students that came as adults to the US uh, and uh, they're still working through their English even though they're going to be teaching English. Um, and they did, they did, they were a little tougher on me as far as, are you really teaching us? You know. That's, you know, I said, yeah, you'll see, you'll see. But I win most people over by the end of the semester. Okay, we have nine more. minutes left of the session and we have some more okay. questions. Uh, the next question yeah. is, I'm also wondering how you manage the workload, including providing individual feedback and preparing content. Okay, uh, this is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> okay, um, I'm one of these people, yeah, it's, it, it's a lot of work. I, 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 I do have to say that's a disadvantage. If you just wanna go in and teach and do your old thing, it, it's, it's, I can't believe how much more time this takes. On the other hand, once you design a SOFLA course, I designed this course in my grammar course in 2016. And sure, I tweak it, but I've been offering it every fall, 2016, 27, and I just, I added perusal, for example, this year, which I wasn't using, so I had to prepare perusal. But once you've set up your course, it runs, it just runs by itself. And you get to know what kinds of sign-ins are good, what kinds of whole class you'll probably need to do. Uh, you know, the first time, it's like any course, the first time you teach it, it's extremely time consuming. But the workload isn't bad for a course you've already converted to SOFLA. 
that's the best way I could talk about it. Okay, you get into a routine. Yeah, that's what I, that would be the way I'd answer. Anything else? So, uh I have a question which I hinted at uh, in my uh, form last night when I filled out the form. And so accountability and autonomy, if, if you know, we want students to develop their own autonomy, we want students to do the work because the work is there for them to learn. And we don't always want them to need to be required to take a test or to get points for something or to demonstrate that. And so okay. I, I kind of struggle with that. Yeah, okay. Well, we all do, but the problem is if you take a piece of this model and you don't build in accountability, the whole model kinds of falls apart because you'll have student, if students need to do their part and if they're not doing their part, they're not gonna get what they need out of the class. So I do believe in going on the accountability side. However, um, I did write an article once that might be relevant here, which is, it was the focus was more on keeping your job and the administrator and all of that. But what I did was I said, okay, if your class meets five days a week, I don't know how often you meet your class, five days, three days, two days, one day. But what you do is you set aside a time when there is no accountability and you just tell the students, you know, fun Friday or something like that. And you say, okay, let's, let's, let's do whatever, you know, whatever we feel like doing today. And you can, you know, do your own thing, get your own groups, I'll give extra help. And you just make it a very relaxed, atmosphere where there isn't so much accountability. And that goes under the, um, under actually the E of enrichment, because if their enrichment leads to motivation, so you're enriching your entire course by having a fun Friday and they look forward to it. And so that's a nice thing to do. Uh, also guest speakers. Sometimes I have a guest come in. This is another, pre I give another presentation on the four E's where I only talk about the four E's and all the ways to develop the four E's, it's a separate thing I do. But one of them is to have guests. And, and guests, I don't make them accountable when there's a guest. They just enjoy the guests, they ask questions, it's interesting. So you put things, you can sort of put a few things in here and there where it's not accountable, but your regular work has to be. Okay. But that's a great question. These are great questions. We have another question. What about asynchronous courses? How, what recommendations do you have for student interaction with asynchronous courses? Do SOFLA, don't do it. I'm sorry, <laughs> I tried. I tried doing asynchronous courses. They don't, they don't work as well. They don't work as well. You, you need to try to be synchronous, even if it's a very short time frame and they're an internet connection. I know someone wrote about Wi-Fi being really hard and internet being hard for them. Um, and I know that's an equity issue too. But if they if they aren't interacting with you and with each other really like, like we are right now, um, if it's all asynchronous, I didn't enjoy doing that. I tried it. I felt like, where are my students? <laughs> I just, that's why I believe so strongly in SOFLA. So I, that's my recommendation. I mean, you can have them do Flipgrid if you want, you know, something like a Flipgrid. Everyone does a Flipgrid and they watch each other's Flipgrid and they respond. Uh, so, but it's it's not in real time, it's, it's asynchronous. Also perusal, I didn't mention this, but if they're on at the same time in perusal, they can interact with each other um, they don't have to, they, they're not like talking or anything like that, but they're, they're in perusal at the same time. They can have discussions in, in real time, which is sort of still, I think what you're talking about, because it's not live with webcam and audio, but they're on at the same time and they see each other's avatar. Oh, so-and-so's on, you know, like that. <laughs> okay. Other questions? I think that we're wrapping up. Yeah, uh, that's it for questions. Just lots of thank yous. Thank you. I experienced the same about culture. Uh, thank you for the tips. Thank you. Especially like that you used us to programs like Peruza who gave us concrete advice on how to overcome students' fear of using technology. Lots of thank yous. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So these are just more, there are more slides, more data slides. You can enjoy them. The, the slides are available to you. And those of you who did the pre-work, thank you for doing it. Uh, and I will post um, I will post another document with responses to the questions in the pre-work. So you'll get my responses and I'll give Jalt, whoever I need to give it to, a link to my responses to your questions in the pre-work, okay? It was very inspiring, lots of great ideas.
Yeah, thank you. And feel free to contact me. I'm very easy to reach by email. But remember, I'm 14 hours different, so don't hold your breath for me to respond. It'll be 2 a.m. or something. Um, <laughs> so I, I think we are wrapping up. So could I ask everyone maybe to turn on their microphones and give a large, very loud round of applause for this very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to stop the recording. That way you can see each other. <laughs> Sorry. There you go.